My name is uh, Nikki Warner. I'm the communications director at The Good Acre. We are a nonprofit food hub located in right between Minneapolis and St. Paul in Falcon Heights by the state fairgrounds. Um, I will uh, just do a quick run through of um, what I'm gonna go through. I'm gonna talk about our mission, um, what is a food hub, what we do, um, you know, looking at that USDA definition of um, an aggregator and how we interpret that through our services and programs. Um, starting off with um, our mission. So the Good Acre was uh, constructed in 2015. We opened our doors in October of 2015. Um, our mission shortly after we opened was um, staff came together for a strategic planning exercise and we came out with, uh, we connect and strengthen farmers, food makers and communities through good food. Um, we were established with some seed funding from the Polad Family Foundation. Um, so that is how we really got this amazing facility, um, which I will kind of show the, the blueprints and some pictures of later on in the presentation. Um, what is a food hub? The USDA definition, a business or organization that actively manages aggregation, distribution, and marketing of source identified food products, primarily from local producers um, in the ability to satisfy wholesale, retail, and institutional demands. So at the Good Acre, we do these things um, and more. You know, food hubs are definitely a crucial but often invisible part of the food system. <clears throat> You know, we are able to help small farmers grow through a combination of distribution, marketing services. We offer technical assistance to help farmers build capacity to uh, start growing for, for new wholesale markets. Um, currently, there are only about 300 food hubs in the United States. And, you know, all of them at their core are connected with um, or are concerned with connecting the dots between producers and consumers in their food system. Um, so what we do at the Good Acre um, is warehousing, obviously, is a real key part of what we do. <clears throat> we offer a farm share program, which is like a CSA, but it's really a multi farm share program because we source from about 20 different growers to um, provide for our 18 week farm share program. <clears throat> We're intentional not to use CSA. We think that's really a, a relationship between one consumer and one farm. Um, Wholesale produce, wholesale um, grower support services. We have a shared use commercial kitchen, which I think sets us apart from a lot of different food hubs. Um, in that kitchen, we're also able to do farm to school culinary training. We have a vocational culinary training program with a farm to school focus. Um, we're also doing virtual events, but um, in the past we did a lot of cooking classes. So using that kitchen, um, was a way for us to really diversify some of our, our revenue. Um, I'll start just by going a little bit deeper into uh, the warehouse, you know, cold and dry and uh, storage and also the space to wash, sort, pack produce are just really key factors for farmers to access, especially if they don't own their own land, if um, building, you know, pack sheds, wash sheds or getting power even. Um, out to like a rented plot of land is um, not possible for, for many of the smaller growers in the Twin Cities. Uh, we use the Monit wireless temperature sensor uh, system so that we can always keep an eye on <clears throat> um, the temps in each of our coolers. We have one that's at 37, one that's at 38, and one that's at 42, we keep, uh, or 41. We have three different cooler uh, levels just for, for different crops, prefer the different temperatures. We also have a freezer. So you can see here um, in our blueprint here, um, this is our, our freezer space. This is our kitchen space. It's about 800 square feet. Uh, we also have a classroom, um, which is right now just a little bit of office space while staff social distance, but it's been able to host some really great events. You know, we don't host just, you know, community like birthday parties in our classroom. We really try to focus on events that are um, with our partners that are doing work to further uh, strengthen the food system. Um, so 
let's see, I'll move on to the next one. A little bit about our farm share program. This is really the foundation of some of the you know, of the programs that allowed us to build a relationship with farmers, purchase produce from farmers, get them into our grower support pipeline through um, different farm visits and food safety consultations. Um, we're up to 500 full season members. Our 18 week season goes from mid June through mid October. We've expanded our farm share to offer add ons. Um, we have weekly and bi weekly eggs, we've got monthly honey, um, monthly meat. Uh, bi-weekly cheese, we have a peak season fruit share. We tried offering fruit more frequently in our farm share. Then we realized that it's just really difficult to do in Minnesota's short growing season. Um, our pickup sites kind of dwindled because of the pandemic with um, a lot of offices working remote. So I'd say about 60% of our members pick up at the Good Acre. The other 40% are spread across about eight to 10 public pickup sites throughout the Twin Cities. <clears throat> we also have a fall campus share that's like tailored toward, toward students' uh, budgets. It's um, a smaller share box with four to five produce items a week for uh, starting after Labor Day through the end of October. Um, and we do a late season share. Um, we actually just put our late season share on sale this week, we were really waiting to see what the season was going to be like, or what we think the um, capacity will be for us to to offer that. Um, we usually don't go over a hundred late season shares, just because sometimes it can be a challenge to get that many storage crops um, reliably. Um, our wholesale program. So uh, we've partnered since we opened our doors in 2016. We've partnered with nearly 30 K through 12 school districts in the Twin Cities metro area. Um, <clears throat> we've built a partnership with Regions Hospital. Uh, we provide uh, a Hmong postpartum herbs mix to their uh, food service program. Um, that's been a really cool relationship that we've built up. Uh, we work with Bon Appetit Food Service Management to do corporate uh, and campus cafeterias. Um, also, a lot of the schools that we work with um, have moved into the pipeline of our culinary training program. We've learned pretty quickly that you can't just sell a school like a thousand pounds of butternut squash and expect that to go well. So by offering the support to um, do recipe development, train on combi ovens, steam kettles, um, tilt skillets, and some of the equipment that um, school kitchens have and can utilize, we are able to kind of help them implement using local produce um, and do it efficiently and within the time constraints that schools kitchens have. Um, but while also like starting to slowly increase the amount of local produce they are able to utilize. Um, new in 2020 was really uh, our pivot to working with schools, which had a drastically diminished ability to utilize uh, scratch cooking with a lot of the commodity meal boxes that they would um, send out to students and families in their districts. Um, we really stepped up our partnerships with Hunger Relief, um, working with different partners to purchase local produce that needed a market, um, that needed to be paid a fair price. Um, and I think that we learned that it was, our, our Hunger Relief partners learned that we were able to get a lot more culturally relevant fresh produce into communities of color. And um, I don't know, it's just, um, it's it's hunger relief with, with dignity, giving people choice, giving people foods that they're used to. Um, a lot of our growers are, are Mutton or Latino. Um, we also do work with um, a few larger Anglo growers, but um, having that diversity of growers um, that work with us really has made our wholesale program really robust. Some of the resources that we um, use in our wholesale program, we use the local food marketplace order online order portal. Um, so we update that. We update it nearly daily. We don't keep inventory in the Good Acre warehouse, but we just communicate with growers what they have, what we can offer in the portal. Um, we do a weekly wholesale newsletter with um, spotlights of different farmers that our um, farm programs team have gone out and done farm visits for in the weeks prior. Um, but really the food hub you know, model allows us to offer produce from a network of almost 40 growers and wholesale right now. So 
that is a really great benefit to a customer, especially if you're thinking of like a nutrition services director who doesn't necessarily have the time to maintain relationships with, you know, two or three different growers it's going to take to source cucumbers for their cucumber crunch, you know, that working with a food hub is a huge benefit for, for customers like that. A little bit more about our grower support program. Um, you know, we offer one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. We believe that's a really important way. You can do, um, you know, all of like the, the checklists and fact sheets, but we really think just getting out onto people's farms, looking at their soil fertility, looking at any of their pest problems, um, even sharing ideas between, uh, you know, with what farm, farmers neighbors are doing because they just don't have time to get out and do that kind of research on their own in the thick of it. Um, David Van Eckout is our grower support specialist who you guys will hear from, uh, I think tomorrow. Um, I'll quick run through our kitchen. Um, we opened the Good Acre with the hopes that farmers would be using our kitchen space to process produce. Um, we've only probably had about three farmers use our kitchen to date, but I think we've realized that part of a robust local food system is allowing, uh, having a place for local food makers to make their product, store their product. We're able to connect local makers with local growers. So a lot of our makers in our kitchen are produce-based value-added um, makers. Um, the culinary trainings that we've done in our kitchen have been a really great boost to our wholesale relationships with schools. Uh, it's a great team building exercise. You know, we're really invested in making sure local food is tasty food on the lunch line. Also, these farm to school efforts are to, in order to help schools increase lunch participation, um, which is really important for schools being able to continue farm to school programs. We offer all kinds of different types of training. Our vocational culinary training program is uh, an, our newest program. Um, we have a group of about a dozen uh, future culinary professionals working um, Last year they were working in the Good Acres Kitchen, but this year they're working in the Eat for Equity training kitchen um, or catering kitchen for training. Um, and we hope to place all of our program participants after their 10 weeks of hands-on instruction into a um, partnering kitchen at either a K through 12 public school, uh, one of our hunger relief partners like uh, Chow Girls Catering or Minnesota Central Kitchen have been host to some of our culinary training interns. Um, you know, a lot of the school districts that we work with just have told us that um, they have a really hard time hiring culinary professionals who have the experience to be farm to school leaders. Um, and that really all starts with just having a base of um, scratch cooking skills. So that is what this program aims to do. And it's led by Michelle Cunningham, our lovely culinary education manager. Um, these are some of the products that are made in our kitchen. Like I said, a lot of them are produce-based, kimchi, pickles, uh, blueberry and apple crisp. Um, you can head to our website to see a list of current makers who are renting our kitchen. Um, other th things that we're up to, um, last year we helped, along with partner organizations, um, establish the local emergency assistance farmer fund. Um, it was like a collective response to help uh, connect farmers who were in need of a market to uh, local hunger relief partners across the Twin Cities. We got some funding from the Bush Foundation last year, which allowed us to spend over $300,000 with farmers, um, translating to about 150,000 pounds of produce that we were able to donate to local hunger relief partners. We, all right, hitting that timer. I'll quickly wrap up my um, spiel about leaf, but we were able to purchase last year up to $7,500 of produce from each approved farmer in the program. This year, we're at $3,500 per farmer and we're hoping to secure some more funding to continue this program through the end of the growing season. But um, yeah, it's just been really interesting to see that even though the pandemic isn't what it was last summer, that there's still a huge need for farmers um, who have qu haven't quite rebounded from the that just sharp cut off in market access, you know, decreased farmers market traffic. Um, the LEAF program really has been pretty crucial for, for a lot of our growers. And also in a post program survey, I think 88% of farmers said that LEAF helped them reduce on farm food waste, which um, 
was kind of an unexpected benefit. You know, a lot of farmers, it's more cost effective to just leave produce in the field. Having an incentive program like Leaf to purchase that produce um, and donate it to those in need was um, a great way for farmers to get more out of the fields. We're also involved in a little bit of advocacy as far as um, supporting farm to school, universal free meals, um, matching dollars at farmers markets, which was actually um, like stunningly on the chopping block this past legislative uh, round. So um, that, that about wraps it up. Um, you can follow us and see more of our work if you follow us on social media at the Good Acre MN. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat, reach out to me. My email is Nikki at thegoodacre.org. Hi everyone, I'm Michelle Kenyon with Field the Family. Um, I've been director of Field the Family now for about three years. I will say uh, the Good Acre is a really tough act to follow. I'm really impressed with the work that they're doing. To tell you a little bit about our organization, we are also a nonprofit 501c3. And we also have an education component with our food hub, um, but we're much smaller. We serve um, Johnson County, Iowa area, which is Iowa City, and then Lynn County, Cedar Rapids area. And I'm going to attempt to share my screen and I put together a few slides just on the, just a few things about our organization. Let's see. Is this working? Can I get just a thumbs up? Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Field of Family, like I said, is a 501c3 nonprofit. We focus on food system education, expanding access to local foods, all with the goal to enhance our environmental, economic, and community health through local foods. What we do, we create connections between growers and eaters, schools and farmers, food service staff, and local food as well as food hubs to food hubs. We are part of a great, uh, larger entity um, or larger loosely organized Iowa Food Hub Managers Working Group in the state where we're able to work together and provide and even provide sourcing support as well. But ultimately, you know, we're educational nonprofit, So we work to bring the farm to the school, both in the cafeteria and in the classroom. Um, we promote you know, of course, seasonal menu planning and uh, local foods in on the school lunch menu, as well as holistic food system support. So we'll bring um, what we call the a farmer fair. We'll bring it to the entire school. It's an in-school field trip where the kids will go and shuffle between farmer and farmer and farmer, and also talk about soil science and nutrition, as well as outdoor classrooms throughout the day. But we will. Um, of course, um, we relied very heavily on being able to access schools physically um, throughout our time as an organization. So um, we had to pivot just like everyone did last year and adopt more of virtual models so that we could reach students and teachers within the classroom through a virtual way. So we created a farm just classroom portal online where we were able to have farmers um, talk to the students and the and the classroom and the teachers directly through organized and scheduled visits so the farmer it actually became really fun because rather than the farmer coming in the classroom and bringing props which is also neat um, we had the farmer out in the field you know talking to their animals and showing off what they were growing and kids were really engaged much more than we we expected with a virtual pivot but um that is something that had to happen in order for us to maintain our connection um to this component which is a really important part of our organization and of course procurement um, we partner with local farmers to procure local food for area institutions for wholesale as well as community members through our online farmers market. We've been around for three years. Um, let's see, there we go. We've been around for three years as, as a food hub and each year has, we've been some, a different type of food hub. <laughs> we, we have grown quickly and changed and adapted throughout the years. Um, but ultimately where we are right now which we're just beginning our third year. 
is that we, again, serve as a connection between small and mid-sized farmers, big buyers and consumers. We do this through an online ordering platform, which happens to be local food marketplace as well. Um, we, you know, provide one invoice with orders from multiple farmers with one delivery. And we also, of course, work with our customer partners to provide a lot of education. Um, this, from the beginning, uh, we've we were at the table with them as they were working to procure and set up their menus to identify the best crops to get into the school lunch menu, to identify the best crops to get into their cafeteria at the retirement community um, that met their price point and also their, their demand. Um, but first, you have to understand seasonal menu planning. So we would start with the basics with each of our customer partners. Um, we would work very closely with our farmer partners. Just some background, this organization started off years ago, before we started a food hub, we were a buy fresh by local chapter. So we spent years and years partnering with farmers just to help promote local food and farms. So by the time we were at this point, we, we had a lot of strong relationships with, with local growers. We knew what they were growing. We knew what scale they were. Um, and of course, you know, not everyone was interested in wholesale at the time. That's what we were starting off as wholesale. Not many people at all. So we really had to focus on them, but not only we had to recruit because we had buyers who were interested in products that some of the farmers that had chosen wholesale weren't interested in growing. So we also had to recruit some of the farmer, far, local farmers to think about and scale up for wholesale. But of course, we had to figure out a lot of things first, which um, crop planning, seasonal availability, um, and you know the challenging task of how to choose which farmer to work with for each crop. We opted right away to create a rubric, um, a rubric that would basically score um, uh, score a farmer based on our top priorities, which was location for one, of course, um, ability to and interest in providing wholesale crops at a price point we could sell and also scaling up a product that we needed and consumers were interested in. But also easy to get a hold of. <laughs> This was a, one of our biggest challenges. How do you reach people? And at the time, we, we, when we first started, we decided not to opt in for a fancy online ordering software. We were very scrappy. We still are, but adopting that ordering software from local food marketplace makes us a little bit more sophisticated than we once were. So um, being able to just communicate with farmers was important. Of course, texting, calling, or email, whichever one worked best. And of course, texting, we, we did a lot of that. Um, but that was a priority in our, and when we chose farmers, um, was communication. And then ultimately, we needed to have multiple sources for each product. So um, the, we went with a primary, secondary, and tertiary option. So we would have farmers that were our primary on red bell peppers, um, but our secondary on green. Um, and then we'd have another, another farmer potentially that was on green. Um, and when they, if, when they didn't have it available yet or when they were sold out, we would go to our secondary. Of course, a lot of promotion, a lot of promotion with um, just in general with our work with Buy Fresh by Local, we would promote to the community, but we would work with all our our buyers to promote within their own cafeterias. And again, you know, Nikki went through that a little bit with um, what they were doing, um, setting up an infrastructure that puts food safety first is important. And the other thing we do is, like I said, we work with other food hubs. So we're able to fill gaps of availability for other food hubs throughout the state. Why we do it is very important. We always start with this. Um, it's important for us to connect our community with more local farmers and local food. It, and what we learned last year was it does create more uh, stronger food security in our region. This is um, where we're at right now. 
we have local these local products listed. Um, we have over three dozen small to mid-sized growers that we work for work with that are within 100 miles of Johnson County, and um, we're currently working with schools, colleges, retirement communities, um, hunger relief organizations, and other small businesses, restaurants, caterers, food trucks. Ultimately, though, a food hub is, you know, is the infrastructure, it's the food safety, it's all that, but it's also the people. It really takes the people first. Relationships are key. It's number one. It's why we even exist as an organization. Uh, we work very closely with the Johnson County Board of Supervisors to um, create a food plan for the county that, um, and in, in creation of that that plan, we identified gaps in our current infrastructure for local foods. And the biggest gap and the most obvious one was a gap in wholesale availability. And the Johnson County Board of Supervisors chose to make it a priority and put it in their strategic plan that they would ensure that a food hub existed in Johnson County and can service the community even outside its borders. So we worked very closely with them to um, put forth our proposal for Field to Family to launch a food hub three years ago. And they provided our seed funding and they provided funding ever since. This, that funding helped propel more matching funding from other area governments, including the city of Iowa City, other small cities, and a little bit more you know, funding that just came along with it with um, people who wanted to match and, and support our organization and our work. It takes a lot of money to launch and we're small. We're, we don't have a large facility. We have a thousand square feet really, but we share space with another nonprofit, uh, Food Waste Rescue Agency, table to table. It's been a perfect fit for us as a nonprofit because they only have so much need for their space and we only have so much need for it too. So we're able to share really well. They also have a fleet of refrigerated vehicles. So when ours is out of commission, we, or if we need an extra one, we can borrow it easily. Um, they also have a box truck. So whenever we need to use that, which isn't very often yet, but we hope to some, make it more often someday. Um, right now we're using it primarily in late August and September when schools really sourcing a lot of local, but we hope to use it more year round as we scale up. But ultimately, like I said, it's the people that make, make this work and the relationships are key. So that's really where our focus is, is always continuously working on those relationships. Hi there, um, great to be here. I'm gonna share my screen, um, let's see here. Hold on, let me get the right one. Okay. I think this is the right one. <laughs> You'd think after all these months that I would have figured out how to do this. Okay. Are folks able to see that? Okay, I'm gonna assume that you can see that. I'm not seeing any confirmation of that, so. Yes, we can see um, it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> hey, so I'm Sarah Lloyd and I am the Director of Development for the Wisconsin Food Hub Cooperative. I have worn some different hats over the years um, as the um, interim general manager of the Food Hub. Uh, um, I have been the secretary of the board. Uh, currently, I am the director of development on a part-time basis, and I also sit on the executive committee of the board as a, at the pleasure of the board. Um, we are a farmer-led cooperative. We're a for-profit entity. Uh, we are owned by the Farmer Patrons and the Wisconsin Farmers Union. Um, we sell over 60 different uh, fresh vegetables, both conventional and organic. 
Um, and I'll be speaking in the afternoon, you know, more about our operational model and our management strategies and tools and things. Um, but, you know, as uh, other Food Hub presenters here have talked about, you know, the, the idea of founding the, the cooperative and getting it in action was to really be able to provide some ease in market access for farmers so that they could be successful um, and viable. And so, you know, our Steve Hookstra, who's on the right in that picture, he's our president and he, you know, really put it well where he said, look, I want, I want to be out in the field growing vegetables. That's what I do best. So I want to leave the logistics and the sales and everything to the staff at the co-op. So that was, you know, really our big um, impetus for, for putting this together. Um, just some, some history. So the Wisconsin Food Hub Cooperative came out of an effort by Dane County. So Dane County is where Madison is. And they did a big extensive feasibility study. If you're interested, I believe it's still up on the web. I can also send it to you as a PDF. Um, they did the Southern Wisconsin Food Hub feasibility study, and they were looking for some entity to take the business that was uh, envisioned to launch because the county was not going to run a business. So the Wisconsin Farmers Union had been part of these conversations and decided to step up with our uh, long history of cooperatives and cooperative development. Uh, we had a lot of help from the UW Center for Cooperatives, from Extension, from the USDA. Uh, and we started in, we incorporated in 2012 and did our first sales in the season, growing season of 2013. Um, we've continually grown over the years. Uh, we would like to get up to $3 million in produce sales because we feel that that would support um, the still pretty lean staff. Um, we haven't quite uh, broken the $3 million barrier yet, so we're still working on that. But um, we have uh, uh, also started our own transportation company, uh, and I will talk a little bit more about that um, in the afternoon. Uh, one of the things that we do is that um, we provide kind of a set set of services and those services have evolved and changed over the years uh, based on the needs of the farmer members um, and the needs of the business. So, you know, we are a business and we have to balance like the financial health of the co-op as an entity, but we, because we are in it for the farmers, um, we also need to make systems that are viable for the farmer members, but we provide sales. We have a full-time sales manager and an assistant or associate salesperson. Um, we do marketing. Um, we have worked on point of sale materials with our buyers. Uh, we do logistics and transportation. As I said, we've started our own uh, transportation company about three years ago. Uh, we had been contracting all of the refrigerated transport and just found that it was really expensive. <laughs> and we'll talk about that more. And also we just could not get the transportation that we needed when we needed it. Um, and so we formed a subsidiary company fully owned by the cooperative that um, actually runs its own trucks. We employ uh, year round drivers. Uh, we also assist farmers with the food safety um, and production quality assistance uh, that we need. Um, so we do require GAP, so good agricultural practices certification, um, because that is a requirement of the majority of our buyers that we have to show that everyone is GAP certified. We have done a group GAP program. And in past years, we've actually had a specific staff person that is paid to go out to the farms and help um, make sure that farmers are, um, you know, able to get their uh, 
uh, operating procedure documents and, and food safety in place, uh, because that's obviously super important. And then we also help people make sure that they're, they're producing and packing to the buyer specifications, which primarily is grade one USDA standard. And I'll talk about that more in the afternoon. We also provide all the invoicing um, and billing services. Um, you know, the co-op is dependent on the success of the members and the members are de dependent on the success of the co-op. Uh, so we do a lot of work during the winter and the off season um, to get projections and, and then negotiate commitments from buyers and, and with hearing from our farmers. Uh, we do not carry an inventory. We had done that in the past. It just became uh, dangerous from a cash flow and a risk perspective. So all produce that is brought into our warehouse. We have a 9,000 square foot refrigerated warehouse uh, in Wapaka, Wisconsin, which is kind of in the north or central, north central part of the state. Um, any produce that is brought into the warehouse is attached to a, a specific PO. So we don't bring in produce speculatively. Um, it's all packed to a specific order and then brought into the warehouse and then distributed. Um, the other key thing about the co-op member relationship is that the farmer is not paid until the co-op is paid. Um, and over the years that has shifted from net 15 to net 60 um, part and this is a cash flow thing for the business of the co-op so we can talk more about that it's something that we're in kind of constant communication with members and it's always a big topic at our annual meetings and things so uh, but trying to make the business work um, we have actually primarily ship our product into retail grocery stores. We do some shipping into distributors and we do some direct ship to uh, food service. Um, right now we're not directly shipping into schools or hospitals, although those are people that we've been talking to over all these years trying to figure out how to make that work. Um, now that we have our own trucking, we have more ability to direct ship, you know, like a direct, like we go from the warehouse to an institutional buyer rather than, you know, shipping into a distributor and then them buying from the distributor. So we're, we're working on that. Um, obviously, as we'll talk about later today, the, um, because the transportation costs are the big part of it, um, you know, we've really tried to figure out like what are minimum orders and things that have to be in place to be able to kind of cover that transportation cost if you're going to do a direct, um, a direct uh, delivery. Uh, so, you know, what we've really tried to do is match the scale and the quality and the location and the logistics, you know, with the farmer. Some of our farmers are directly shipping right from their farm. It doesn't go in through the warehouse. That's usually if people have like whole semi loads of product. We have several sweet corn growers in our um in our membership and so oftentimes like if they're shipping an entire semi load of sweet corn it, it just goes right from their farm to the buyer um and we originally strategically picked the retail grocery channel um because of what in wisconsin we had the roundies grocery chain and at the time when we started in 2012, 2013, they had two centralized distribution warehouses, one in Stevens Point and one in Oconomowoc, which is west of Milwaukee. And the reason we chose them is because we could bring a straight truck or a semi truck to their distribution center and then they distributed to their 150 stores. And at the time they had stores in the Twin Cities, they still have stores in Chicago and they have stores all around um, Wisconsin. And so um, that was a strategic decision because this transport cost is so high. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and we'll see you this afternoon. Um, 
And then next up, we have Laura from Big River Farms. Yeah, this is super interesting to hear about all the different models. I, I don't even think of Big River Farms technically as a food hub, but according to the definition that Nikki gave, we are. Um, so I'll go into a little bit about our program. My name is Laura Mirafuentes. I'm the Big River Farms program manager. And I've been working at Big River Farms for the last seven years or so. I started as an intern a while ago, and now I'm managing the program. So I've seen a lot of different parts of our program operations um, over time. And I'll go into a little bit of a history of what we do. But we are a program of a larger organization that's called the Food Group. And so we are one of three program areas. The organization mission is fighting hunger and nourishing our community. And we have a food bank. So we have a large warehouse about a 50 minute drive uh, more or less from where my office is located and where our farmer um, food hub is located. Um, so we do um, hunger relief um, programming and, and we distribute food for organizations that are giving it away for free. Um, like soup kitchens, food shelves, places like that. So food bank is one, one arm of our work. We also have affordable grocery programming. So we've got a mobile grocery market, the Twin Cities Mobile Market, and we also have a, a bulk buying club called Fair for All. And so um, that's, again, it's not for free, but we're, we're trying to make um, healthy food affordable for folks that, um, that need it. And then Big River Farms is the third program area of the organization. And what we do is um, we really exist to support BIPOC farmers who want to farm as a business and primarily in the Twin Cities area. So um, we, we offer this support in a number of different ways. One of the ways is through land-based education. So we have um, a a whole bunch of different classes that we offer in the winter um, on anything from production planning to building a market plan to, um, uh, I'm blanking here, organic and organic certification, record keeping. There's a whole um, class series that we offer to beginning farmers and in particular farmers of color. Um, and folks who have also, um, we, we offer simultaneous interpretation into multiple languages if language accessibility is, is, is difficult for other educational opportunities. Uh, we also offer a lot of technical assistance. So um, we, we have a farm, I'll get into that here, but um, we've got folks that are really knowledgeable farmers that are going into the field and doing one-on-one -on -one work with farmers, helping fi figure out the post-harvest hand handling standards, um, figuring out what what kind of bugs are eating people's plants and how to how to handle that. So there's a lot of technical assistance in the field and also um, out of the field. So we also have, you know, business planning, technical assistance, helping people figure out how to analyze the records that they kept. So there's a lot of education um, that we provide. And I do want to also mention we also host in partnership with a lot of other organizations here in the Midwest, the Emerging Farmers Conference. And so that's, again, um, a language accessible conference for farmers. Um, and it's also free for farmers if, if income is a barrier to attending other farming conferences. So it's usually about 250 or so farmers attend that conference every year. Um, and yeah, last year we went online for the first time. So that was a big experiment. But um, so the education is a hu huge core component of the services that we offer. Um, we also provide access to land and infrastructure on our 150 acre incubator farm. And so that's where I am right now. I don't have a very pretty background because I'm in the copier room at the farm. We don't have any private meeting, meeting room space. So, um, but it's a really beautiful space outside this office. Um, so we've got a 150 acre farm. We're in Marine on St. Croix, Minnesota. So we're about a 30 minute drive outside of the Twin Cities. Um, and we are certified organic, so that's something that definitely helps in terms of markets. Um, we got our, I'll go into our history. I keep wanting to go into the history in, in this my little, in, little intro, but um, we've been certified organic for a number of years, and that's uh, another differentiating, I guess, piece about what we do is that um, technical assistance and help in getting farmers certified organic that are interested in that. So. Um, some of the farmers too that do the education program are not actually farming here on our incubator farm, but they're also 
um, just taking the classes and farming on other land that they've been able to um, gain access to or, or that they own. And um, the organic certification piece is a really big uh, point of interest in our program for farmers. And um, we also, I'll just mention, we have about 15 farm teams per year that farm here on our incubator farm. And it, we also have a few more, like I said, that just take classes that aren't actually growing on site. Um, but we do have, you know, quite a bit of support here and shared infrastructure. And this is also where our, our food hub is located right here on the farm. Um, and we're mainly working with the 15 or so farms that are farming here on site with our aggregation and food hub. So it's a little bit of a different setup where we're not aggregating from farms from all over the place. We have bought a little bit from graduates of our program who have gone on to farm on their own um, land or elsewhere. And um, if, especially like if we're running short on tomatoes or something, we might call up a graduate and be like, hey, do you have some tomatoes we could buy? Or we used to do a little bit of contracting with graduates as well. Um, but mainly we're working with the folks that are here on the incubator farm that are just kind of getting started. Um, so the other way in which we're, we're aiming to support BIPOC farmers who want to farm as a business is by providing some supplemental markets. And so that's kind of where we come into the food hub um, type of work. And so we have uh, 230 or so member CSA um, that we have gotten. So the CSA is, um, is made up again from produce that's grown by the 15 or so farm teams that are here at our incubator farm. And so as staff, we're managing the marketing and the operations of aggregation and um, customer service and things like that, the delivery. And basically we're contracting with farmers. And I, I do have a lot of information about how we do that process in the uh, presentation later today on logistics. Um, but we're contracting with the farmers here to provide the produce that goes into our CSA and then um, doing weekly purchase orders and, and, and putting together a box of produce on a weekly basis that has, you know, produce from maybe eight of the different 15 farm teams that are that are here on every week. So that's the biggest market. And I do have a graph here that shows our sales over time and, and what um, what they're made up of. But we also have a few other market support. So we've got an aggregated farmer's market stall. So this is something that's definitely changed over time. Um, we go to just one farmer's market in Minneapolis, the Kingfield Farmer's Market. It's a great market. People buy a lot there. It's like a grocery shopping market as opposed to somewhere people just want to have their coffee and donut and listen to the music. So it's a great sales market um, and it's difficult to get into. And so that's one way that we use our um, name recognition as a you know, an organization we've been around for a while versus some of the small farmers are just getting started and people aren't totally sure who they are. There's also um, difficulty sometimes as people are just getting started and still learning um, to be able to fill up a whole farmer's market stall every week for the whole season. And so we're able to um, have basically a shared stall space under Big River Farms. It makes it a little easier too, because we are all growing on the same, all the farmers are growing here at the same farm, Big River Farms. So it's a little bit different. I know there's um, some difficulties if people were farming in different areas, sowing under the same tent, but for us, we can do it. And um, farmers, um, this past year has worked the best in this year too. Um, we've been uh, selling under Big River Farms and then farmers have been managing themselves a schedule of who's gonna go on a weekly basis. And then the primary farmer will go and fill up as much as they can. And then they'll do some aggregation from the other farmers in the farmer's market cohort, we call it. So we've got like five different farm teams that are interested in that. And so they're coordinating amongst themselves. And so we're facilitating, um, facilitating that and those relationships and helping people get started. And then they're really kind of running with their own aggregation and figuring out the schedule and um, going on a weekly basis. So it works out really well for people that haven't had um, that don't have, yeah, it's a kind of supplemental market. So people are able to make money and also it's a exposure and learning opportunity um, that's worked really well. And then, so we also have some internal um, markets. So I mentioned we're a food bank. So we've got a, a big warehouse. We're working with, you know, hundreds of agency partners that are doing hunger relief in the Twin Cities area and actually out into greater Minnesota as well, a little ways. and. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about this as well, but like um, some of the other 
uh, folks have talked about, we had a, we, we had a big, <clears throat> um, there was market loss for some farmers and also a huge demand from food shelves and, and um, different hunger relief um, partners uh, for produce and food in the last uh, to this year and on last year. And so that really jumped up the amount of produce that we were able to buy from farmers due to some increase in funding and also that increase in demand. Um, so that's something that's sort of new. We had always wanted to figure out a way to get some of the produce that farmers were growing um, into those communities. I mean, I think it's always been uh, kind of difficult because like, you know, some of the farmers markets where people are able to make the most money are not reflective, like customers are not reflective of where like our farmers are coming from. And, and they've always wanted to sell, figure out a way to sell produce back into their own communities um, at an affordable price. And it's always been a difficult thing to do because especially we've got the organic certification and farmers are like severely underpaid. And so that's always been a really hard balance to figure out. Um, so in a way it was, it was, it was kind of cool that we were able to um, to put some of the produce from farmers into the hunger relief markets um, and also into the affordable grocery programs that we have. I mentioned we have that Twin Cities mobile market bus program that goes around the Twin Cities and also Fair for All Bulk Buying Club. We were able to put some Big River Farms produce into those programs with some increased um, supplemental funding, essentially. But it's it's we're trying to strategize now, like, can we keep that going into the future? And how could we how could we figure out the funding to back it up? Um, we also have a very limited amount of wholesale that we manage. So we're really trying to um, pass wholesale markets off to farmers um, who are able to fulfill them on their own. We used to um, be an intermediary as Big River Farms at some point, and we're managing some relationships, <clears throat> doing weekly availability emails and calls to some restaurants and some different wholesale partners and trying to like build up that relationship. And then we just sort of decided like, it might just be easier and better in the long run to, anyway for to try to pass these relationships off to farmers directly um, and also to work into in partnership with some of the organizations that um, are also working in this space. So there's um, there's another uh, farmers co-op um, that was around um, the shared far, shared ground farmers cooperative that was doing some wholesale aggregation and they were able to buy from some of the big river farms farmers for a while. And then um, the Good Acre, who's on this call, um, has been able to buy from some big river farms farmers as well and, and you know, put that into some wholesale markets. So we kind of have stepped out of the, the wholesale space for the most part. Um, and that's a picture of, this is a field walk. It was actually a really fun thing. Those are some of the farmers that are in a program. Um, a couple of years ago, we just did a mid-season field walk, probably around this time of year, um, because farmers have their head down a lot of times in their field and never take everyone, you know, it's hard to hard to like look up and, and do a walk around and see what everybody else is doing. But um, we did an evening field walk one year and uh, farmers were able to learn and share from each other. So that's what that is. Um, and we've got farmers from many different backgrounds. We really started out working primarily with Hmong and Latino farmers um, back when the organization started up, because those were the two groups that um, were most prominent in farming in this in this area at that time. And um, then later have expanded to work with other groups of farmers as well, um, just as the interest from those groups has has grown. And so this is another aerial picture of the farm. So you can see, you can't actually see the fields. I should have put one where you could see the fields too, but these are just some buildings, I guess. We have a few, a lot of shared infrastructure and spaces. So um, it's not, you know, State of the art, but it is pretty nice comparatively speaking. Um, if you were to start off on your own with not a lot of um, capital or uh, not inheriting a farm that's like got a lot of infrastructure, we've really have a lot to offer as opposed to renting a piece of land. Um, so we've got you know greenhouses and high tunnels that farmers are able to use and learn in. Um, we've got a lot of buildings for storage. There's two walk-in coolers um, in the building on the right there. Um, that's our packing shed on the far right in the middle. There's a um, a gray tent uh, on either side of the packing shed, and some there's wash lines under there. It's it's a little. I mean, it's not like a big, really nice indoor space, um, but it really is nicer than a lot of infield stuff that that farmers um, 
start out with in a lot of times. So, so we've got like a brush washer and different things. We've done some improvements in there. Even just adding gravel under the tent was a huge improvement for food safety. Do a lot of food safety education too in there. Um, and then, yeah. So anyway, that's our farm. I just wanted to mention too. So our, our market goals are really as an organization, it's for farmers to develop sustainable markets. So we're you know, an educational incubator program. And really our long-term goal is to um, set farmers up to be able to be sustainable um, after our program. And that's, I mean, that's a really difficult thing. Um, farming is really hard and, you know, there's so many things set up against people as they're getting started. Um, but we're here to try to, you know, help take away some of the barriers and help set people up for success in the long run um, and develop sustainable markets is one goal. And then, the other, the aggregation and food hub piece is really, we're trying to give people a leg up as they get started. And we're trying to serve as a secondary market for when other markets fall through. Um, so give some support, but really not, um, not be the primary or sole market for farmers that are in the program, because then long run, we're not able to buy everything from everyone forever. And so it really doesn't set people up for long-term success if they're not able to develop their own independent markets or connect with people like the Good Acre or other organizations that can buy um, more from them in the long-term. And we're also not trying to really do income generation. So we're not operating, we're a nonprofit organization. We're not operating as a business. We get a lot of grant funding and other support to operate. And so that's not really our modus operandi, um, which has developed over time. Um, we used to be an organization that was an independent nonprofit a long time ago, and our budget was, you know, hovering around five hundred thousand dollars a year. And at that point, it was a little bit more important for us to, um, yeah, I guess just like we were thinking of the markets in a different way. Um, but over time, that's developed. We've become a part of a larger nonprofit, so we have a little bit of more organizational support, and we can really focus on those two primary market goals, though, not really worrying as much about trying to make a bunch of money from our markets. So my last slide here, um, this is just a little bit of a history. So I mentioned we used to be an independent nonprofit. Um, we were founded as Minnesota Food Association back in 1983. And um, at that point, it was a really, we were more of an advocacy organization that kind of birthed out of the downtown St. Paul Farmers Market was um, slated for um, development into something else. And so there was some people that came together and did a bunch of advocacy work around that to maintain that as a marketplace for farmers. And um, at that point, I believe it was quite a few Hmong farmers that were um, trying to get into that market and that were selling there. And so that's how we kind of ended up um, working a lot with Hmong farmers. And um, I think Latino farmers, there's a little bit of institutional memory last year, as you can maybe tell. Um, but um, anyway, we in 1998, so a number of years later, it was really more advocacy focused for a number of years, to my understanding, um, in the late 90s, started formalizing some of the farmer training as as the as our connect, you know, we had these deep connections with the um, Hmong and Latino farming community at that point, and, and there was a need for um, education and technical assistance. Um, a lot of that was done wherever farmers were farming and renting land or, or had found land to purchase at that time. Um, so, and then in 2005, since land is such a difficult thing to come by, we ended up leasing the incubator farm where we are now um, to be able to make land a little bit easier to access for those beginning farmers. Um, 2007, we started our CSA. So, we, we had grown the CSA to 240 members by 2014. I'm honestly not totally sure. I was looking as I was preparing for this. It was kind of interesting to look at the history and try to find all the numbers. Um, I, I started in 2014. So that's definitely some, like where my memory begins. So some of my charts don't go back 100%. But um, but we definitely had gone up to 240 members by 2014. I'm not totally sure exactly what had happened before that. Um, in 20, 2008, we had um, gotten our organic certification. So that opened up some markets for farmers as well and made our CSA a little bit more unique and competitive. Um, in 2016, we had a big CSA market, uh, CSA uh, member decline. And so I was around for some of that. There was some huge staff turnover and like 
we went through some hard times when we were this global scrappy nonprofit and we had a really hard time holding on to members. Um, I also think that maybe it, there was, you know, I, I think there was like a boom in like the number of CSAs available. And like, um, I think that it was just harder and harder to retain members over time um, and grow the CSA, which was what we were trying to do. Um, so the organization went through some difficult times there. And in 2017, we merged to become a program of the food group. And so that's when we got a little bit more support. And, um, and then the next, I guess, new thing after the merger um, was that we had our first hunger relief market in 2018. So that was pre-pandemic. That was, you know, we merged with the, this hunger relief organization. We're trying to figure out, like, how do we complement each other? Um, and they were able to get some funding. We got some funding from a local co-op, a food co-op, um, to purchase some, some produce from farmers at wholesale prices to then give away into some of the food shelves. And so that was the first time we did that. It was like, um, you can see my numbers down there in my little graph. Um, maybe you can't actually, I don't know if I put my hunger relief markets in there. Anyway, <laughs> it was um, not a huge amount. I think it was $10,000 or $7,000 or something. Um, in 2020, um, we obviously had the pandemic, there were uprisings and with George Floyd's murder and um, lots of demand um, for local produce and um, also lots of demand from the hunger relief communities. And so that market really spiked a lot um, in the last couple of years, as well did the CSA. So you can see we, we're we back up to 230 members, 230 members, which is kind of where we started a while ago with our CSA. Um, and you can see like just the sales and like how do our, those, so these are in thousands of dollars. So like how has our CSA looked over time? The CSA is the blue numbers. You, this is gross sales, um, fruit CSA. So we do we we buy some fruit shares from some some neighboring farms um, as a, like an add-on, and we our so wholesale is really small at this point, but it used to be a little bit more substantial. And then you can also see farmers market. Those are really estimates, and it's gone down because we've passed that off to the farmers. So farmers are making that money now rather than us aggregating as we used to. Um, thank you all for introducing your food hubs this morning. Um, we have about 20, 15 minutes for questions. There are questions in the chat that I'm going to ask. And then from then on out, just unmute yourself and uh, feel free to ask all of the um, presenters any questions. And you'll be learning more about each of these food hubs throughout the next two days, too. So some of this, I know we have a whole session or portion of a session on uh, food safety and food safety education on farm. So um, there, there will be a lot of that as well. So I'm just gonna go through these, bear with me. I'm gonna go backwards. So um, one question is, could you all talk about the pros and cons of operating a hub as a nonprofit versus for-profit? I can jump in. Um, you know, we set this up as a business, the Wisconsin Food Hub Cooperative. Um, and, you know, ideally we would be of self supporting business. Uh, we have had the benefit of USDA value-added producer grants, local food promotion program grants, Wisconsin Department of Ag, um, buy local, buy Wisconsin grants. We had a specialty crop block grant. So we've had grants. <laughs> um, and so that's helpful as additional revenue to support staff costs. But ideally, and I, I mentioned it, you know, we would like to get up to $3 million in sales. We charge a 14 to 20% commission on the value of the sales. And that we think could put us kind of in uh, a good shape. The other thing as a business that we're able to do, we do have a loan from CoBank which is a cooperative lender that has been guaranteed by the Wisconsin Farmers Union. But the other thing, I think it might be diffi more difficult to do as a nonprofit is to like have access to financing and operating capital. I will say we, when we first launched and the assessment in the community, this came together and they did an assessment to identify the need for the food hub. We did look at forming a for-profit or farmer cooperative type of food hub initially. And there were two reasons why we chose not to. One, 
is that the, the Iowa City Area Development Group and a local economic development group did a study, a market study on a food hub and found that it would not, at least their, their findings found that it would not be sustainable for many years, if at all. And that was really hard for us to digest just in general thinking about asking people to invest in something that a market study showed it would not work for quite a while. They, they, the research report recommended going with the nonprofit model. And then two, um, the initial funding from the Johnson County Board of Supervisors was contingent on it being a nonprofit organization that received it. They did not feel even a cooperative was a not, was something they wanted to give public dollars for, thinking that would unfairly provide product, uh, a benefit to private businesses, um, even though the, the profit from that would have been very little, <laughs> it still wasn't something they were willing to support. So we, form, we, we went ahead and, and kept it under our umbrella for those two reasons. I'm happy to, to answer that question too about the pros and cons of operating a food hub as a not profit versus for profit. Um, you know, at the Good Acre, we operate programs that are very similar to for profit, you know, farm shares, uh, shared use commercial kitchen, uh, our cooking classes formerly, you know, those are all for profit activities that go to support our mission. But ultimately, you know, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. And I think that just allows us to be a resilient, a more resilient model, um, you know, allowing us to be more competitive for grant funding opportunities. Um, and really our mission based work is to educate the community, provide uh, farmer support, you know, connect eaters and growers. And so, you know, yeah, it was just kind of a no brainer for us to um, apply for that nonprofit status and have our for profit type programs feed into supporting our overall mission. I don't have too much to add. I just will say, you know, we were a nonprofit a long time before we ended up doing any aggregated markets. Um, and I know that at one point we looked into during like our difficult times going through lots of staff transition and having a lot of hard time fundraising looked into also and this is before the Good Acre existed locally here too. looked into the feasibility to like could we make income generation like a thing through our aggregated markets and like the feasibility study was like not really unless like you make tons and tons of sales and so we also just sort of um steered in the nonprofit direction because of that I do think you know there's obviously limitation grants are awesome and they're also like sort of limiting in ways you know you have to like make if you get a federal grant if it's a three-year grant then you're sort of like tied into these projects even if things change so I think like there's and you know it's a little bit you're a little less nimble I would say probably as a nonprofit than a for-profit but um but it's worked for us so thanks um another question was do you offer cold storage for some products such as apples to gain a price advantage to sell them in the off season and I I'm not sure if that was directed towards Sarah because that came in during her uh, presentation, but if anybody wants to speak to that price advantage in the off season. Um, we do we do not generally hold any kind of inventory other than, you know, if it has if if we can get POs and this does happen in the winter, maybe for potatoes or squash, we may bring in like two weeks worth of potatoes or squash, you know, in one shipment into the warehouse and then maybe it goes out over like two weeks because we can store that. Um, and, but certainly that is a strategy. Um, and I think apples, potatoes and, cer and certain crops would, would work well with that. I think the thing that we've just had to worry about is that if we bring stuff in sort of speculatively and then it somehow can't sell or there's issues, then it always is that, well, who's responsible for that? Is it the, the co-op or the, the farmer? And that's been kind of the thing that has been difficult over the years. But you all, I mean, bringing stuff in um, 
is is a strategy for getting sales more year round, which is something we've really tried to do. And so we count on our potatoes. We do sell some sliced apple product. We have an apple grower in Wisconsin that's slicing and doing those little kind of snack packs. Um, and those have we been a good um, winter product for us to keep our trucks moving. Prior to coming to Minnesota and working at the Good Acre, I worked um, for Fresh Farm Markets in Washington, DC. Um, it's like a network of producer-only farmers markets that supports the Mid-Atlantic region. And Adams County, Pennsylvania is a huge growing apple growing region. And I know that there were some food hubs out there that did controlled atmosphere storage for apples to do exactly like what you're talking about, Michelle, just gaining a price advantage to sell fresh apples in the wintertime on, you know, this Northeast market. I haven't really seen a lot of that um, here. And, you know, as far as cold storage for um, just different storage crops, you know, at the Good Acre, we'll have carrots, watermelon radishes, um, maybe like sweet potatoes, if it's a good season or butternut squash through until maybe February is as late as we'll go. But for, for us, real vegetable winter is like March, April, May, until new stuff starts coming in June. So, you know, the cold storage um, doesn't get us a full on year of fresh produce with the, the short growing season here. But definitely check out some of those models like out in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, um, even I think some Northern Virginia places that have some of that controlled atmosphere storage for to, to really do some serious, you know, move some season crops um, in winter. Thank you. <clears throat> um, next is a question for all presenters. I think Nikki addressed this in the chat, but this is a big one and I'm sure it will continue to come up throughout the next two days. Could you give an estimate of the price a farmer would get selling through the food hub compared to selling direct to consumer? And then the follow up is what is the markup on products by the food hubs? So at Field of Family, we strive for a 20% margin when we sell through to our customers. Now, does that happen? Um, not very often. Some, it depends on the margin or the, depends on the customer and the distribution channel. But ultimately, we try to make it so that we are charging at basically 20% margin on the product to the customer, um, depending on how much we get it from the farmer. The big challenge that we've had though in, in taking that on and working with farmers on pricing is that we found that a, several of the farmers we started talking to didn't really know how much it cost them to grow their products. And so that was part of the initial education and work that we needed to do with our farmer partners is to help them understand exactly the, the value of the crops that they're growing and how much it costs to provide to us because they, there's many different factors to consider when, when they price. So, and once we know and for sure that the farmer knows how much that costs them to get to us and they apply their margin, make sure they cover their costs, then we're able to advocate for them when we go to, to sell their product to, so that the customer can feel really good about providing a fair price for that food. I'll say, I and mean, we have, we've been trying to pay 75%. That's basically our, we try to keep our prices high. We kind of have a price list that we have and we try to review it. Um, like last year, we, we actually called like the Good Acre and we called some local co-ops to try to get an idea of like how much, uh, like, you know, we do an annual review of our price list. We also take farmer feedback. We have an annual meeting with all the farmers we work with and, and ask them like, is this all like looking good and fair? And so we try to Co collaborate on coming up with our price list and then we do 75% for everything we aggregate we do 75% payout to the farmers. Um, we, as I mentioned, we charge a 14 to 20% commission on the value of the sale so we have full transparency to the farmers on what the buyer is offering we obviously try to negotiate for the highest prices we. We try over the winter even to say like, look, we can't really go below, you know, these costs for our farmers. Um, but 
you know, we are selling into the wholesale markets and right now organic prices are in the absolute toilet. Michigan is dumping a bunch of their product. I don't know what's going on with Michigan farmers, but they seem to be able to put a lot of product into the upper Midwest at really low prices. Um, so certainly people selling direct are going to get a much, much higher price. But I think what Michelle mentioned is really important. Like, do farmers really understand what their cost of production is like if they're doing a direct market, you know, have they taken into consideration, you know, the time at the farmer's market, you know, the staff time. Um, what we have found and what we are offering with our for our members is is the ability to sell easily sell more so you know they're kind of hopefully getting into some level of an economy of scale if they're investing in some infrastructure on their own farm like some maybe a dock or a walk-in refrigerator thing so i mean i think that's kind of the wholesale markets are definitely lower price and we are just operating into basically normal wholesale markets without really a premium the premium that we can get is basically we're trying to solidify the relationships with the buyers so that we can go to them like we just sent a letter to our main grocery buyer and said look you told us that you were going to buy x amount of dollars of product over the season and this is how much you've purchased so far and you're not going to hit your mark if you don't start upping your orders and then we immediately got a bunch of orders but that's because you know we have to fight for that so it's not puppies and roses but <laughs> but it is part of why we started the food hub because a group of farmers we felt could better have those relationship building than each farmer trying to do that one-on-one -on -one with the buyer um i'll quickly just chime in that at, at tga our our wholesale margin usually is about 17 percent um i will say that we do try to contract with growers as much as we can before the start of the season so we can kind of settle on what that price will be um, before the produce really starts rolling in um, but then i also wanted to mention you know the platform that we use to sell most of our wholesale produce local food marketplace that presents a, a challenge for us because produce is listed from each grower and each grower is got a different price, which takes the power away from our wholesale manager, Steve, to um, just say that green beans are one price across the board. So by you know having a customer log into our local food marketplace online order portal, they can see green beans for sale from four different growers and they may not be picking, you know, you know, it could be a higher price for organic. One farmer could be gap certified. One is a smaller grower. You know, it, it gives, we're kind of giving the power to the buyer to potentially just shop for like the cheapest thing, you know? So it's been a challenge a little bit. Like how do we use this local marketplace to help to support equitable purchasing whenever our prices are so transparent and a buyer could just say oh it's cheaper to buy it from you know the the the, the bigger you know 25 acre white owned farm down the road as opposed to some of these other growers that are you know that are hand weeding everything that don't have mechanization to help with harvesting so um i'd say that is a challenge of some of our um our online ordering and maybe steve can go into that more later in the session so yeah, thank you all for presenting. And I, I wanted to share something that as I was re researching for this course and speaking to food hubs across the country, the thing that I kept hearing, and I think for everybody to keep in mind over the next two days is that if you know one food hub, you know one food hub. They're all completely different. And so, you know, what you'll see is just kind of how each of these hubs is handling a number of different things. And you can kind of put that in your toolbox um, to move forward.